What's his name? Rand, not Randy Quaid. No, Dennis Quaid. Dennis Quaid. Yeah, he like he's a total he was, ranger monster hunter. Yeah, I don't know that I would bring up Bowen oh, come on. from Dragon. Come on. You, you can if you want. <laughs> Anything to be able to say, I am the last one. Hello Explorers, I'm Pruitt, this is Jim Davis, and our RP class series strides right along with the Rangers as we're gonna help you push the frontiers forward and make sure your concept makes its mark. Let's get to it on WebDM. Where does your Ranger, where do they fit? in an RP aspect, where do they fit in the world, right? Right, a lot of this, a lot of the RP stuff for, for the classes is really about making sure that the character class you've chosen from yourself has a place in the world. And right. that you and the Dungeon Master have thought through the implications of what it means to be a part of this class. The Rangers are one of those that suggest something about the campaign world just by their very inclusion. Yeah. Right. So the the ranger is is has a theme and a story of of this unending watch beyond the boundaries of civilization. They yeah. whether they were were born there or whether they sought that region out, they exist beyond the border, beyond the frontier. And and they are in in some senses like the first line of defense mm -hmm. uh, for monsters and rampaging humanoids and threats yeah. that originate in the frontier region. You get the impression from rangers that they that they would be doing this regardless. Like there doesn't need to be a big organization that's sending them out there. Mm -hmm. That that they are very independent minded. They're very focused on on keeping civilization safe from threats that originate in the wild. Right, and while those townspeople uh, might think them uncouth and might not want them in the bar, they definitely want them on the border. Sure, Because right. that's, that's where they belong, right? They, they, that's where they belong. And, and Save us! Right, and they might develop a, 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 a sinister reputation because they are seen as mysterious figures who mm -hmm. you never really know where they are or what it is that they're doing. The work of rangers is unseen, perhaps unappreciated yeah. or, or unaccredited uh, to them. It might be a case of where the greatest victories of the Rangers are unsung, unheard of, because they happened out on the lonely, trackless wilderness that, that you know, exists in these worlds. Right, and the, and the continuity of that civilization that they're protecting and the normalcy of it yeah. is the evidence of their victory. The right. fact that they aren't dealing with these marauding bands of goblins or orcs or whatever right, it right, is, right. and they just live their mundane lives. And when the ranger comes to town, every time somebody kind of says a snide remark, it's like, well, you wouldn't be able to make that unless I did my job, so you're welcome. Yeah, so you're welcome. And, and there's probably a reason why they avoid civilization in towns, things like that, because, mm -hmm. well, I have a bad reputation, but I don't want to develop sort of a disdain for the people in the places that I've sworn to protect. Mm -hmm. So I'm just going to stay out in the wild and, okay. and remain there. Let's go kind of go through the subclasses and, and talk about how each of these kind of would interact with the world. It's like starting with the Beastmaster. The Beastmaster is a, a type of ranger where you can imagine that they're probably a, a loner of some type. Maybe they you know feel a strong connection to the natural world. Maybe they have uh, connections with or associations with a group of druids or, mm -hmm. or a barbarian tribe tribe that has a strong connection to a certain animal or something like that. The Earth Guard, however they are pronounced in Forgotten Realms, have that kind of each tribe has a yeah. animal that they yeah. that they associate with. Maybe your guard or whatever. Yeah. yeah. Maybe the Beastmaster Ranger is connected uh, through that. Maybe they did receive formal training somewhere and there is a uh, an organization or at least a place where people go to uh, learn how to bond with animals and to to form a special bond with a certain kind of animal so that to the point where where you gain the the mm -hmm. the connection that a beast master ranger has and I guess it's it's worthwhile to mention at this point we're not talking specifically about either the PHB ranger or the revised ranger just sort of rangers in general <laughs> yeah rangers that get along with beasts but thinking about like how did the beast master and the the beast meet Mm -hmm. What are the circumstances of it? Yeah. Um, how do they communicate 
is another one is is the does the ranger have some sort of supernatural ability to communicate with just this animal or is it that the animal is really in tune with the beast master and 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 picks up on it is that developed over years of training or is it some kind of ritual that they underwent mm -hmm. there's the mechanics of it all the mechanics work the way the mechanics work but the story that you're building and the backstory that you're creating for your character is another matter entirely and whether you reflavor, reskin those abilities uh, when you're thinking about your backstory, or come up with something completely different, that's you know that's one of those things that's that's largely up to the player in that respect. So moving on to the the gloom stalker, right? Like the gloom stalker. How, like, how do you see like really RPing a gloom stalker like? Properly, I mean, this is somebody who resides in the Underdark. Yeah, well, that's that's my you first know. question there. So the, the frontier regions in a D and D world extend not just across the horizons, but yeah. underneath the earth. You got that Z axis to worry about right. too. <laughs> you do because there are threats that originate from under the earth in, in the typical D and D world. And whether it's say a, a group of dwarves or deep gnomes or something that have taken it upon themselves to guard the pathways that lead down into the veins of the earth and and, and keep the monsters down there. Mm -hmm. uh, or it's one of those things where maybe the Gloom Stalker is responsible for patrolling borderlands that 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 have a that share a border with like the Shadow Fell oh, or yeah. something like that. They're they're preternaturally gloomy or they're supernaturally dark and and something that like the Gloom Stalker's there, not because they want to be not because they like it there, but they realize that there's some benefit from having someone in the dark places, yeah. keeping an eye on things, making sure that the threats that originate there don't get out of hand. Yeah. But it does imply they're, they're going beyond. They're not just in the forests and the fields and things like that. They are in magical, fantastic locations fighting the fight to uh, as sort of the first line of civilization's defense. Yeah, yeah, there's always those people that have to do the the dark and dirty work and yeah. uh, that that's who that is. Where did they get your training? And I mean you can answer ask this question for just about any of the rangers or even really any of the classes, but Gloomstalker's one of those where because of the changes that it makes to the character and the things that you can do um, you know, it's like, where did you get that training? Were you forced, whether you're, if you're a surface dweller, to go down into the Underdark and mm -hmm. spend a lot of time down there yeah. until you become attuned with the place? If you're dealing with a place that's that's sort of known for its darkness and shadowness, uh, like, say, the Plane of Shadow, are you, do you live there or some kind? Are you attached to maybe a monastery of shadow monks or a cabal of shadow sorcerers and you sort of are, are a protector and a guide as well as uh, a defender? Uh, mm -hmm. for the region, like thinking about those things, how you connect and where you received your training from, um, particularly for classes that rely on either the martial weapon and armor proficiencies that, that make them, and, and the D10 hit die that make them warriors, mm -hmm. uh, and then their individual class abilities differentiate those uh, and, and give them further power, or you're talking about a class that features a lot of skills. Well, Rangers is both of those. Yeah, They've got the fighting capacity of a warrior type class, but they've also got the skills of, of those specialist classes that, that use uh, their skills to overcome obstacles. And so it's really worthwhile thinking about the Ranger, like where did they learn all this? For the Gloomstalker, it's like how did they learn to move about the dark like that? How did they learn to navigate those environments? How did they learn to conceal themselves from creatures that can otherwise see in the dark? Mm -hmm. um, thinking about those questions will, will let you, you know, it'll, you'll learn something about your character that way. Yeah, you go you go down to the uh, the Deep Gnome uh, Ranger Academy where the head where the head teacher <laughs> is like a a blind old ranger that the drow like blinded. And yeah. Except he just walks around no stick, no nothing. No stick, no nothing. Doesn't dodges eat it. people. Things out, are fine. You know, yeah. I mean. And he teaches you how to walk in darkness. Sight is a weakness. Yeah. <laughs> he will grant you sight beyond sight. Yeah. You don't um, need a sword of omens. Yeah, no, screw that. <laughs> um, so uh, taking it back a little bit more, uh, you, you know, the stereotypical ranger, like the hunter. The hunter, you know, yeah. I mean, this this is someone who goes out. Classic and, ranger. Classic ranger. They know how to track. They know they know where to hit hit their, their targets, you know. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, like, how, how do you... How do you kind of spice that up? This is one where digging into the the background of your character. What was there a, a organization of rangers and other affiliated uh, persons that they were a part of? Is this a mentor and apprenticeship style relationship? Are they a trapper or a frontiersman or or some kind of a stalker of some kind that? 
uh, that that already was on the frontier region, already out in those borderlands. Perhaps it's like a, a wood elf way watcher, and she keeps guard over the different pathways that lead into the the, the elven kingdom there, or a, a halfling bounder or sheriff, who just with a stout stick and a, and a sturdy sling, you know, keeps the wolves out of the sheepfold and and makes sure that the goblins don't get in the the barn at night. You know, mm-hmm. and they just, they, they walk the borders of the community and, and as such have this kind of stigma of, or perhaps a stigma of being rough, being a little wild themselves, and yet at the same time fulfilling a very important purpose, which is defense and protection, because the night is dark and full of terrors and the world is filled with monsters. Yeah. And someone needs to be there to keep an eye on things to make sure that, uh, that they don't attack. Maybe there were a poacher who mm. you know? Who was you know flaunting the, the 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 king's edicts and doing whatever it is they wanted, and they just saw too much out there before yeah. they decided to take those skills at stalking and poaching and turn them towards like, well, we're we're going to hunt the threats that that matter, and not so much like making a quick buck off of selling poached meat or, or yeah, yeah, yeah. Or something. Do that criminal ba- criminal background ranger. Right, yes, um, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> maybe he got caught by the, the local game warden and he taught him like, you know, there's a better way. Right, who is the uh, hunter ranger themselves. Yeah. And yeah, for me that's the hunter, very classic. Uh, mm-hmm. But they also have all of those uh, combat abilities that you'll want to account for. Where did they learn those things? Is it practice? Is it passed down by generation to generation? What what sort of uh, techniques are they using to, say, be able to uh, fight creatures that are much larger than them, or uh, you know, develop the the speed necessary to take out multiple enemies at a time? Those kinds of things you'll want to give some thought to. Mm-hmm. Uh, and and where did they learn these things? And you know, was it formal or was it more self-taught? I think the ranger really lends themselves to being like a self-taught warrior and a self-taught um, survivalist almost. Yeah, especially like the hunter there um, talking about taking you know giants down, watching like animals and how they take prey down. Yes. It's kind of the same thing. I mean, kind of the you're same a hunter, thing. you watch your prey. More of a monk style, really. Like well, It's like a monk. There's, there's bits of monk there. There's bits of totem warrior. Yeah. I mean, and this is one of the things about D&D classes is that uh, particularly the f- the way fifth edition is laid out, there's a lot of conceptual overlap oh, yeah. between these classes, yeah. and uh, certain types of hunter ranger might share a lot in common with certain types of barbarians, yeah. and and maybe very different than say a, a scout rogue or a war or a fighter with the outlander background or something like. All of those have they're in the same vicinity. They're, mm-hmm. they're warriors at home in the wilderness. Yeah, yeah. It's the specific iteration of the ranger with their favorite enemy, the natural explorer, the ability to navigate the terrain, and, mm-hmm. and, and of course, the magic that they have as part of their, uh, you know, as part of their spell casting that, that makes them different than scouts and outlanders and things like that. Uh, so moving on with the, the Horizon Walker. Yeah, this person that, that <laughs> walks the plains and, and knows the way, all the ways through, right? <laughs> right. Where do you learn that shit? That's really one where you, you want to delve deep and, and ask your, yourself as you're making your ranger character, it, you know, is there perhaps an organization of, of, of rangers and like-minded individuals that watch the hidden pathways to other worlds, mm-hmm. right? It's one thing to plane shift somewhere and, and use magic and, and the force of spell casting to traverse the planes. Mm-hmm. But there are natural crossing points. Oh, yeah. Uh, you know, a fairy ring on, on, on Midsummer's Night will take you into the Feywild, some the places like that, or being caught in the Wild Hunt's path. As it as it rides through the night, um, it is one of those ways that you can find yourself in the Earl King's lair, and and you know being a part of uh, of the the wild hunt pack or or play or you know similar to like say the Gloom Stalker, maybe there are areas where the Shadowfell bleeds over into the world and undead are, are something that really are, are are a problem. These are the kinds of rangers that those natural spaces in the world where the other worlds and dimensions and planes that make up Dungeons and Dragons multiverse cross over 
those rangers guard those areas. And in a typical D&D world, there's probably a lot of places like that where strange magical effects abound and planar magic is present. And the, the, the Horizon Walker doesn't like have an academic, like deep understanding of them, but they're able to understand enough and the threats that originate from there that they guard those places. Mm -hmm. And that's really, that's how I see the Horizon Walker fitting into a larger world. Now it's time for the player to ask themselves, you know, if they go this route, where do they learn this? Is it an organization? Is it a mentor uh, apprenticeship relationship? Or are they self-taught? Um, and answering those questions will tell you a lot about what kind of uh, world that you live in. Yeah, what yeah. kind of world they inhabit. And then closing out, uh I mean, Monster Slayer. Monster Slayer might be my favorite of the Ranger archetypes because it reminds me the most of my one of my favorite video games, The Witcher. Yeah. Right. Geralt is really, and, and Witchers in general, really, to me, I think Ranger is a better fit for them than just about anything. I know it doesn't match up. There's The signs are different than D&D spells yeah, yeah, yeah. and all that other stuff. But speaking thematically, not trying to translate the abilities of, of a Witcher into D&D, but just like the purpose of The Witcher is that it's a professional monster hunter and that there are monsters that exist in the world. And you don't want just anybody going out and fighting them because some of those monsters are not really monsters. They just look like monsters. But yeah. They're thinking, reasoning, sentient beings that need to be negotiated with. Some of those monsters have tricks or traps or things like that associated with them that a headlong charge and rooting them out is not going to, to cut it. And then there are monsters that are just too dangerous. No matter what kind of, of knight or warrior you, warrior you are, you need that extra edge that being a witcher gives you. I see Monster Hunter fitting firmly and solidly within that theme, right? They've got a bit of magic to back them up. They are able to fight and deal with the spell casting monsters that are all over the D&D world. And, not, and, and, and they're better equipped for that than say a hunter is. Yeah. Which hunter is more equipped for dealing with like big beasts, giants, you know, you can see a, a hunter tracking down a manticore or a rampaging hill giant or something like that. Where it's the monster slayer where if you have if you have a hag on your hands or if there's a particularly vicious fae or something like that that you need to need to have rooted out. The monster hunter is more appropriate. Sorry, the monster slayer is more appropriate than the monster hunter. Good grief. The regular hunter and the monster slayer. Monster Slayer Hunter. Yes, the hunter Trapper. of monsters to slay. The hunter of slaying monsters. Uh, <laughs> so let's talk about some RP hooks here. Some of the RP hooks from Xanathar. From Xanathar. So right. you got you got your view of the world, which is 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 I love that for Rangers. It's perfect. Since uh -huh. they, like you said, they do kind of reside on that border between civilization and nature. Uh -huh. uh, you also have your homeland, so where they're going to be happy and at home yeah uh, and then their sworn enemy right 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 um, so let's let's start with the with the view of the world like how should a ranger see the world it, it's a big question to ask right because if we're if we accept that the core story of the ranger is that un, you know a, a warrior who has an uh, and, and a never-ending watch in the wilds to protect civilization, mm -hmm. then their view of that civilization and civilization's place in the larger world informs a lot uh, it could be that civilization is a a, a, a place uh, that they long for in a theoretical sense and and want to protect in a, in a you know in a very concrete sense. But when it comes to living in a city, being around all those people, um, and and having to deal with urban life and civilization, a, a character like the ranger is just like you know what I'm I'm a loner at heart. I prefer the wild places in the world and the peace that comes through nature. And I can do good for you, this thing that I love or that raised me or that gave me a purpose at one point in my life. I will protect you now, mm -hmm. but I've got to leave you. Like, I just can't yeah. be around you. <laughs> yeah. uh, you can do something like that or you could, you could have one that has never known civilization and your ranger is just out there. In an intellectual sense, they're aware that these urban uh, places exist, that great civilizations that are centered around cities and, and, and urbanization and things like that, they exist, but at the same time, you've never experienced it personally. You just know that out here in the wild is where you belong and that there are things out here in the wild that you are sworn to, to defeat and other things that you are sworn to protect. Sounds kind of like Tarzan. 
I, you know, Tarzan see, feels like a, a, a bit of a ranger to me. Mm -hmm. uh, it could be a, a barbarian, could be any number of things, but I, I think, like, you see a, an archetype like Tarzan was just, like, a, the king of the jungle and affinity with all these animals and very physical character. Um, you can sort of see the parallels between a, a character like that and, and a ranger mm -hmm. and, and draw some inspiration from it. Are they disdainful of civilization? Do they see civilization as making people weak? And, and unable to protect themselves, and someone has to be out here defeating the threats, but it would really be better if everyone weren't so useless and, <laughs> and were instead, uh, you know, joining them in a, in a fight for, uh, to, to, you know, to reclaim the wilds from, uh, from all these monsters. Your ranger's relationship to, uh, to civilization is gonna inform so much about them. And chances are the campaign's not gonna take place entirely in the wilderness. And you're gonna have to deal with urban environments and urban settings and civilization. And knowing how your character views it from the beginning is just prepares you for those moments where you can add more depth to your character and show off a bit. Well, yeah, cause like you said, uh, you know, when you gotta go into civilization, you have to you have to think about how that's gonna be with, uh, with regards to your homeland. I mean, like if you're used to being in the open tundra Right. You know, uh, up north and you come down <laughs> a little south and there's the trading village. Well, yeah. how are you going to do that? Yeah, how are you going to do that? I, and, and so the homeland is one where it's that type of terrain that you're most at home in. And that type of environment that when you look at it, you look around and you say, this, this is where I belong. This is what, you know, this is what I want to protect and this is where I want to live. Maybe it is the area where they grew up and has a strong connection to their past. Maybe there are communities there or people in that, that region uh, that the ranger cares deeply about and, and their fight in the wilderness is a personal one and not a civilizational one. It's not, I'm gonna protect the civilization or cities or the kingdom, it's my family is out there. Yeah. If I don't work to stop these monsters, my family will be hurt. My friends, the people I care about. Your homeland's a part of your past, or maybe your homeland is like a place that you adopted. You found it later in life, and you never realized how beautiful the forest was until you visited one. And ever since then, it's been a, it's been a part of you, and you, there's no way you could leave that forest behind. That raises the question of like, how does that interact with your natural explorer ability? Yeah. And, and you know, obviously depending on what ranger you have, the details of that natural explorer ability are gonna be different, but there's nothing stopping you from, from picking a certain type of environment and saying like, yeah, this really is my character's favorite place. They know the most about it. They're the most ho at home here. They've spent the most time there. And, and really fleshing that out and thinking like, What's my ranger's relationship to the environments that they find themselves in? Mm -hmm. How did they learn to navigate those places? Was this based purely on practical experience or was there some sort of formal education that went on in it? And I think like being able to answer that, again, tells you a lot about your ranger. Are they an intuitive loner who just like understands these things and is a patient observer of the natural world around them, which is how, much, how they know so much about it? Or are they someone who has read the ancient scrolls and, and, and codices that the ranger order has passed down from generation to generation, preserving the wisdom of the order and passing it on to a new generation? Mm -hmm. um, those are all different ways and, and mixed and matched. It was a, you ran across a hermit who took you in and taught you the ways of the wild as they knew it. And now you, you know, you've taken up that mantle. Um, all of those are connected to a natural environment and, and given the uh, the primacy of the natural world in the ranger's theme, it's worthwhile thinking about how you connect to the environment around you and how comfortable you are in it. Invariably, there will always be someone who wants to tear down either the civilization you're protecting or the homeland that you call home. Yes. And that obviously becomes your sworn enemy. Maybe not your favorite enemy. Right, right, right. But... Yeah, a sworn enemy. I, I take the sworn enemy RP hook to be like we're talking about like say an individual here, mm -hmm. or at the very least a specific group of people, as opposed to like oh my favorite enemy is like all orcs, but my sworn enemy is like this orc tribe and this one orc warlord yeah. who I have a, a personal vendetta against, something like that. So yeah. that's assuming that your that the enemy that you choose for yourself based on these uh, Xanathar's guides is is even connected 
to your favorite enemy. Because you could have a situation where your favorite enemy is your favorite enemy because the group of rangers that you studied with or, or were a part of, they fight giants, full stop. That's why they exist. But your favorite enemy, or your sworn enemy, that is, is a hobgoblin who was part of one of these giant raids who's particularly nasty or vicious or something. Mm -hmm. So determining whether or not if you, first off, if you even have a sworn enemy, right? Like these are just suggestions. Yeah. Um, and, and whether or not it's connected to your favorite enemy is something that you want to think about. But even switching gears to like just the favorite enemy it, you want to think about what, what connection does it have to your past? Is there a personal connection here? Yeah. Did the favorite enemy that you have, uh, did they do something, did they wrong you somehow? Did they attack you personally? Do you have a, a traumatic experience uh, involving this favorite enemy that you now, that, that led you to swear, <laughs> you know, sort of a, I'm going to defeat them wherever they exist kind of, uh, kind of thing? Or is it more of a, yeah, I'm, I don't have a particular personal hatred or vendetta against this type of enemy, but this, you know, fiends and undead are unnatural creatures that need to leave the natural world. They, they corrupt it, and they are threats to civilization and society, and we have to defeat them, even if you've never been personally uh, injured or, or, you know, um, you know, had something bad happen to you at the hands of a fiend or an undead or something like that. Right, or maybe you're just uh, an a-hole that wants to kill every dragon <laughs> until there's only one left. And right, you could be like you already say, like very driven, very yeah. like I've, I've got to destroy these creatures because they're they're you know the destructive power they have is too mm -hmm. great, and that's why you're out there in the middle of nowhere tracking down dragons and giants. And, yeah, and, and, Sean, like and Sean Connery is beseeching you to not. And so, <laughs> uh, it's a shitty movie, but it still. is a shitty movie. Um, <laughs> So, so yeah. So, kind of moving, moving on with, with this, like thinking about the the, the, the class abilities, because they do have the, the ranger does have a few class abilities that that really reach into a lot of aspects of the game with like right. favorite enemy, but also um, like natural explorer, which uh -huh. you touched on uh -huh. earlier. But that affects a lot, a lot of travel. It affects a lot. Affects a lot of travel, and because uh -huh. they're they're sort of the defining class features of of the class, it's worthwhile to think about how your character's background and backstory and how you're gonna portray your character interacts with those things. Mm -hmm. The same goes for all of the class mechanics and, and the, the classes. But like, that natural explorer, uh, again, what does it look like when you're traveling through the wilderness? Describe the way your character moves through, through their environment. Describe how they impart the benefit that the party members receive because there's a ranger in the party. How, how does that work? Mm -hmm. Is it is the ranger giving everyone a pep talk before they go out? Are they constantly minding the group to make yeah. sure? Is it uh, is it sort of a, a, is it a magical presence mm -hmm. and something that just sort of happens automatically when the ranger's in the party that the rest of the group just sort of instinctively copies their movements mm -hmm. and takes cues from the ranger and and uh, you know and, and that's where those benefits impart. It's yeah, yeah. worthwhile thinking about those things because it like I said it it. It's one thing to just be like, oh guys, all right, you guys have a week of, of trekking across the wilderness and then you're gonna get to your destination. All mm -hmm. right, what is it you guys do? And then it's like a couple of die rolls later, all right, you get there. Yeah. And that's like so much time. You, you could, it, just because there's not a fight or a chasm to cross or something, like that doesn't mean you should just rush past it. And there's information and, and role playing opportunities that can come out of those moments when you give characters a moment to say like, or we give players a moment to say, like, what are your, what's your character doing on the trip? How are they interacting with each other? Give me mm -hmm. an idea of what their day-to-day -day life is like. It doesn't have to take up a lot of time. Yeah. I'm just saying, spend more than, like, 30 seconds on it. Yeah, I'm, I'm just thinking now of, like, either, like, a camp counselor or, like, a tour, <laughs> like a natural tour guide. Right. Like, making sure, okay, is everybody with their accountability buddy? Uh-huh. You know, like, yep. keeping everybody everyone holding together, hands. holding hands. You got You're your bag of gorp. <laughs> yep, you got to make sure you, you keep a lookout for any kind of game. I'll go get it. You uh -huh. know, uh -huh. Keep a lookout for these colored berries and pick them when we go along. Right, right, the right. Red, but not the chartreuse. Anyway. Yeah. Uh, so, <laughs> I don't know. I, 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 I kind of like that. Um, and, and, and also moving on, like, like rangers have access to magic, but like, what does that look like? What is right. the rangers? Is it just, is it just something that they know how to do a particular way that's more effective, or is yeah. it magic? 
Is yeah. it magic? I, you know, the, the, the way they kind of explain it in the, the player's handbook is that, you know, rangers spend all this time in the wild and the natural places of the world that they can't help but learn something from it in a magical sense. Which is, again, speaks to the inherent background magic that's in Dungeons and Dragons. The fact yeah. that these places are fantastically magical, even if they're not always spells that you can point to in the player's handbook at work. And so perhaps it is that the ranger just picks up some little, they're dabblers. They pick up a trick or two, they learn a spell. Maybe they spent some time with some druids for a while who taught them that magic. Or they met a, a nature spirit of some kind, a dryad or an, a treant or something that, that imparted some of that on them. Uh, but you could also kind of reflavor their magic to just be knacks or tricks or things. There's... A difficulty there, right? Like, yeah. does that mean that your your uh, swift quiver can't be counterspelled? Um, you, you know, if you're if you're describing your spells purely by the effect that they produce yeah. and not the source of them, then you can run into those kind of uh, those moments where there's a dissonance between what your player thinks of as as their abilities, where they come from, how they manifest, and what the game rules allow. Right. Whether something can be dispelled or counterspelled or whether it works in an anti-magic field. Those details to work out with your uh, with your dungeon master beforehand. I'm kind of of the opinion that because Ranger's not a full caster and their spell selection is rather limited, that there's nothing un, un really unbalancing about saying this isn't necessarily magic. Yeah. This is your cure wounds is a result of you mixing a poultice together from the various herbs that you've found, or you, or you, you know, that you've steeped in a tea or something like that that the mm -hmm. player drinks. It, the effect of it is a one d eight plus wisdom mod spell. Yeah, yeah. But the manifestation of it is maybe not as magical as say a druid commanding the spirits of nature to you know to do its bidding kind of thing. Yeah, no, I, I totally get what you're saying, although I can detect um, uh, Neckbeard's a quiver with rage as you're <laughs> saying that out in the world <laughs> right now. Um, I mean, th there might be. I, uh, I, you know, there's... It, 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 it's, it's a big ask yeah. of a ranger player to, to come to a dungeon master and say, hey, I don't want my spells to be spells. Yeah. Because the fact that their spells means something for the game rules. It yeah. means that there's certain things that interact with them in certain ways. But there's a lot of interest in a spellless ranger. Mm -hmm. And not everyone wants to go rogue scout for that. Some right. people want to stick with the ranger. They're interested in all of the abilities that the ranger gets. Mm -hmm. And I think it's a nice compromise to just be like, yeah, you're only going to know like a handful of these spells compared to the other spellcasting classes. Yeah. And none of them are just like game-breakingly powerful. They're very useful, they're situational, etc. There's nothing that says that this isn't a result of special training uh, or something. Obviously, it's a case-by-case -case basis. Some some magic is clearly magic, yeah. um, and other magic can be more explained by skills and, and equipment and things like that. Right, right. It's up to the, the individual in case-by-case -case basis. So, uh, so, so to close out, let's 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 move on to uh, away from from matters natural. Yeah. And bring it back to the city. Gotcha. Gotcha. And, do, and let's talk about an urban ranger. What would that look like? Like, like how would you do that? Yeah, everybody loves the urban ranger and the urban druid. I, th I This is one of those things about Dungeons and Dragons that I don't quite understand why. Mm -hmm. it, it starts to feel like there's a grid that every that people want to fill in with. Make, we got to make sure we've got a an archetype for every potential. Yeah, it's like D and D character bingo. Yeah, yeah. Okay, all right. We've got urban characters, but we, but we don't have a natural urban character over here. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that said, there is conceptual space for urban druids and urban rangers and things like that. Like I a think rat catcher. A rat catcher is a good one, right? First off, an urban environment is not devoid of a natural component, right? These yeah. are not sterile, lifeless environments. There are there's life there's life that is there. It might not be as abundant and, and unrestrained as it is out in the trackless wilderness, but there are there's wildlife to be yeah. found there. There are animals that to be found there. There's vegetation yeah. and the like. There's all sorts of things that give some kind of natural connection to a city that a ranger can can uh, latch onto. Yeah. So like you're saying, a rat catcher, a hound master, yeah. uh, a stable master, something like, yeah. particularly for the beast master types, there's plenty of animals inside a city that the beast master ranger can share a connection with and sort of be connected uh, connected to. Yeah, I mean, you know, there's certainly there's some version of PetSmart. 
right. in D and D. You know, you got a town. There's you got a bunch of rich people. They want a bird or this exotic uh-huh, thing. Uh-huh. And you got a guy who's like, oh, I know how to get that. I know the people to talk to, and he yeah. facilitates bringing in animals from different places, and and, he, and, and he maybe keeps them like he bought a zoo. He bought a know? zoo, and maybe fantastic beasts as well. Maybe the skills that they them. use yeah. and where to find them, and it, and and. You know, he's got he's got skills with mundane, normal animals, but this is also the guy to go to when you bring back your griffin egg. Yeah. And you're like, well, this thing is going to hatch at some point, and what what, do I, how do I make sure that this thing doesn't eat me when it's big enough to? Right. You know, <laughs> uh, that that's the, the sort of the urban beast master players, is who you yeah. might go to. Yeah, players love raising animals. They just love getting eggs and raising things or that come babies out of them. And, They're just yeah. so domestic. <laughs> and the, yeah, I know, right? What's wrong with We're, these players like, in there? But you're going to go out on an adventure. Yeah, I want to take uh, it with yeah, me. I want to take it with me, right? Like, when you're is gonna it going to ca- be powerful you're enough? You're going to carry it. Can I, can I carry this egg? Put it in a backpack. You got some, got some papoos. <laughs> got an egg papoos. You probably want to do like a bag of holding so it's harder to break. Uh, it snaps know. in like a nut. Yeah. Uh, anyway. <laughs> I slide in like a peanut. Um, mm. So there's a, uh, that's w- one way right there. Yeah. I can also see uh, a bounty hunter as another con- concept for an urban ranger that, that works, right? You've got the tracking. Mm-hmm. You've got the, uh, the, the ability to, to stalk a prey. Uh, they need to be good fighters. They need to be good with skills. They probably have less like survival. Maybe take survival because survival is mixed up with tracking and things like that. But maybe yeah. like not nature or something, and more like say insight or persuasion or something like yeah, that. Yeah, your, your favorite enemy is probably going to be humanoid. Probably going to be humanoid. Well, for one, humanoid's a not a bad pick for, your, for a, a lot of things you find in D and D that are humanoid. <laughs> Yeah. Right. Um, and so I, I think like that's a, that's one. Um, but you can kind of go a, a different route. What if the ra- urban ranger it takes that concept of a lone warrior fighting on the front lines of defense against civilization? That sounds an awfully lot like a vigilante superhero to me. And an urban ranger might be one of those weirdo loners who just dons a cape and a mask at night yeah. and goes out and beats up criminals. <laughs> you know, that's, that's pretty great. That's kind of what that's sort of what they're doing out in the wild, right? They're taking it upon themselves. Unless you've got like a king with an official organization of rangers that officially goes out there. And listen, there's nothing wrong with that. The Roman Empire used to pay agents and and rangers and all sorts of things that were a part of the legion that lived with the barbarians beyond the borders of the empire to report back on what was going on, yeah. to make sure that in case they needed to invade, that there were sympathetic people there that they could rely upon. And these sort of citizens of the empire who lived beyond the borders for years at a time, uh, uncovering threats, and they're kind of like part rogue, part ranger. So there's conceptual space for that, for like this is the royal order of rangers, and you go up through the ranks there, and you study with one of their conclaves, and when you're ready, you're sent beyond the borders of the empire. Maybe you're recruited from the frontier regions to begin with. Yeah, um, that's one thing. I got off on a weird tangent, but <laughs> there is a, a, a sense shocked. that the, the absolutely shocked uh, that the the ranger is a loner. And the ranger is independently minded, and that suggests someone who's not going to wait for the militia to solve all these damn crimes. Mm-mm. They're not going to wait for the inquisitives and the, the, the agents of the crown and, and all those kinds of things to, to come in and solve this problem. Somebody's got to do something. Yeah. And this ranger uh, is going to come along and, and mix it up in the back alleys and sewers of the, the, the town that they're a part of. Um, again, thinking about how they learned their skills, where they learned their trade, the nature of their natural magic to an urban environment. This might be one where I allow a lot of leeway, and I might even come up with like a custom, like here is the custom bonus spell list for the urban ranger, and it features a lot more, say, social interaction type magic mm-hmm. um, than than's normally on the um, on the uh, the ranger list. But again, those are things that you want to work out with your dungeon master ahead of time and. And, you know, just talk to each other and see if there's not a, a way to make this concept work with yeah. the uh, mechanics as they exist. Yeah, that way you can uh, have your hunter make his mark, as it were. Absolutely. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> uh, 
adaptations from Morton Kynans. Oh, oh yeah, that uh, is, there is a book coming Morton out. Morton Kynans, was it? Morton Kynans, Friends and Foes? Foam of Toes. Foam of Toes. I love cosmic level D&D in the same way that I love cosmic level Marvel. I like the big picture shit. I like the big conflicts. I like expanses of space filled with glittering nebulas and and the astral sea with its tiny little portals to other places and dead gods floating through it. I want that kind of stuff. I'm hoping for more planar focused uh, information and higher CR monsters, but I'll be perfectly honest, the higher CR monsters they make are not going to satisfy me. And they're just not. I, I find that whatever design team that, that, that makes them and, and whatever audience that they're uh, making the monsters for, it, it doesn't feel like they're being made for the kinds of games that I'm used to running. Um, so I will have to change them. Things will have to be altered. Um, but I'm interested in the lore of it uh, mm -hmm. most, I think, particularly like the various conflicts that... that uh, that are present in Dungeons and Dragons, where it's like elves versus elves, elves versus dwarves, Githyanki versus Elithids, Githyanki versus Githzerai. Mm -hmm. um, you know, all of those conflicts that are present, uh, I, I'm, I'm curious to see about. And I think Mordenkainen is a good uh, frame of reference for that because, as you know, the leader of the Circle of Eight, he tries to keep the balance uh, on Oith. Which I think is how you're supposed to pronounce Oith. It's Oith. Oith. <laughs> yeah, we're going to go over to Oith. We're going to go over to Oith. <laughs> uh, which should tell you everything you need to know about how seriously the people in early Dungeons and Dragons took their game. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And how seriously you should probably take yours. Uh, yeah. I, you should take your silliness very seriously. Exactly. Yeah. Always revel in the silliness. Always revel in it. Um, yeah, I hope that there's some. Um, I hope we get some random, like random foe charts, like to create foes. And, uh, I don't know. I don't. I don't know ex everything that's going to be in it. Yeah. But I mean, I, I'm sure there's going to be. You know, we're going to get stats on all the people. Stats on. We're going to get stats on Drist and Fifth. Yeah. You know? I, well, yeah. <laughs> but, there are stats for Drist and Fifth Edition. Out there. Oh, already. It's a yeah. CR10. Uh, well, whenever they used him in um, Acquisitions Incorporated game, and Perkins posted the stats he used, oh. so that's about the closest it's come. Um, Tenth level, CR ten. It wasn't, it oh, wasn't, okay, didn't even have levels. Right, right. Sorry, my bad. Yes, yeah, yeah. CR ten. Uh, I think it could have been, could have been more, but I, I, you know, it's one kind of Toma foes is. You know, I, I'm excited. Like I said, I'm excited about the lore, less so about the monster stats than I am about the monster lore, and I, I want, I'm ready for them. I'm ready for the 5th edition team to show us something genuinely new and not just like, hey guys, you remember that thing that you liked or your, or the people who are older than you said they liked when they were young? <laughs> um, like, Here's here the it fifth is. Edition. <laughs> well, it's yeah, remakes abound. Remakes abound, Ooh. and I'm, I was sick of them the first time around. Yeah. Well, um, and but they, nothing... <laughs> but that leads to a whole conversation about, I mean, we've been telling the same stories for... Since humanity has started, That's right? True. And it's so. and, and it's it's kind of like the starter set. Uh, it, it, something is new for someone, you know, all the time. All the time. And my jaded, calloused gamer soul uh, is is perhaps not the audience that the largest uh, role playing game out there, the flagship game, should be approaching. They should be giving you uh, the tools you need to create your own cosmic stories. To find the conflicts in your own setting and and use the stuff that they present you as inspiration for yeah. it. 